The final lecture for this unit is on memory errors. So these are on the ways in which memory uh, causes us to make mistakes. Uh, maybe mistakes in judgment, uh, mistakes in reasoning, mistakes in problem solving. So in my text, I have the following passage. Sometimes we forget or fail to realize that memory is not designed to remember specific facts and details. There's very little exact adaptive significance for that behavior. Memory is designed to generalize, to categorize, and to predict. The goal of memory is to subserve other functions and behaviors like the creation of behavioral equivalence classes and the creation of inductive inferences. We need our memories to be flexible and to stretch the truth. That's learning. So the reason I wrote this, uh, and what I mean to say in this uh, whole lecture, is that our memory, the memory errors that we see, we sometimes think of them as mistakes. We can't remember something or we remember the wrong information. Uh, for the most part, those are just uh, byproducts of a memory system that's operating properly. So in the same way that heuristics are adaptive and are advantageous for us, but occasionally lead us to make uh, mistakes and have a bias, memory errors are usually just the residual byproduct of a good memory. We don't actually want our memories to be perfect. I mean, we might, you might think you'd like a perfect memory uh, for studying for an exam, for, for example. Uh, it might be nice to have a perfect memory if you can remember everything you've read. Uh, so there are individuals who have uh, a nearly perfect memory or a photographic-like memory. Uh, and that can be useful, but for most of us, it's useful to have memory that can uh, assess things quickly. Uh, and sometimes mistakes are just part of that. Uh, so we just make these mistakes. They show us how the memory is actually, the memory system is actually working well for us. So, as I say, we need our memories to be flexible and to stretch the truth. So it's that learning and generalization where we sometimes go beyond the information that we remember that seems to give us an advantage in thinking. But uh, it still gives us memory errors. So let's talk about those memory errors. So I talk about this in my textbook, but uh, this goes back to a, a, a chapter or an article that was published in American Psychologist in 1999. And Daniel Schachter, who is a cognitive neuroscientist at Harvard University, uh, who's been studying memory for decades, uh, laid out what he calls the seven sins of memory. Uh, so these are things in which, uh, because of the way our memory is designed, uh, we sometimes have these problems. Uh, they're unavoidable. So the first of these he lists as transience, and this is just the tendency to lose access to information across time, whether through forgetting, interference, or retrieval failure. In other words, our memories just don't last forever. If we don't do anything with them, or if we don't retrieve them, or if we don't uh, act on them, sometimes that information is transient. So that's sort of a retrieval failure or a forgetting. He also lists absent-mindedness, and these are everyday memory failures in remembering information and intended activities, probably caused by insufficient attention or superficial automatic processing during encoding. So transience, the first one that I mentioned, has to do with stuff that isn't being used and it fades, as opposed to absent-mindedness, which is you're not paying attention and it doesn't get encoded. This happens all the time. We saw that with change blindness, but we also see that if you're reading something. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm reading something, uh, I some, my mind sometimes wanders, and I might forget uh, exactly what it is that I read. Uh, th this can happen on a small level. Maybe I just forgot uh, my place in a book. But this also sometimes happens on a really big level. I notice this happens when I'm reading uh, on vacation. For example, suppose I have some fiction that I'm reading, a novel or a, uh, you know, a fast-moving fiction book or a fantasy novel. Anything that's kind of just reading for reading's sake, just enjoyment reading. It's great while I'm reading it. Maybe it's a real page-turner. Maybe it's a thriller that I'm reading through really quickly. And then when I'm finished, I'm like, I just don't, I hardly remember what I, what I read, right? Uh, I don't pay attention to all the details. I sort of remember the gist, and I know that I enjoyed reading it, but I kind of forget it pretty quickly. Uh, because I'm not really trying to encode it. I'm just enjoying the reading process. I'm not paying attention uh, to the details beyond reading through that page. A third kind of uh, sin or failure of uh, recall is a temporary retrieval failure or loss of access, such as the tip of tongue state 
either an episodic or a semantic memory. So tip of the tongue phenomenon, you probably know, this is where uh, somebody asks you to remember something and you can almost recall it. You know you know the information and you can almost feel yourself say the information, but you can't quite recall it. it happens a lot with names. If you're trying to recall the name of someone famous or someone you know, and it just doesn't come to you. You might be saying something like, I know this, I know this. It just, I can feel myself saying it. It's referred to as the tip of the tongue phenomenon, and it suggests that there's enough memory in your motor system to be able to almost make your mouth say the right words, but there's not enough to help you uh, retrieve the information completely. And usually it's temporary. It's blocked from being retrieved because something else is competing with it. So the first three of these seven sins uh, are about the inability to remember something. So this is you know, failure to retrieve. The next three uh, have to do with remembering things in the wrong way. So misattribution is remembering a fact correctly but attributing it to an incorrect source. So you remember the information but you don't remember who told it to you. It's a way in which we can easily be fooled. Uh, we remember something, we remember hearing something, but we don't remember who said it. Uh, more troubling is the idea of suggestibility. So the tendency to incorporate information provided by others into your recollection. Uh, so this is like a false memory. Uh, the kind of thing where you know somebody told you something, maybe they told you you behaved in a certain way, and you're just not quite sure. Uh, the more times it happens, well, what seems to happen is you remember that somebody told you something. Uh, and the more you remember that, the more likely it is that you start to remember that you yourself did that thing, right? Uh, we often refer to this as gaslighting. Uh, gaslighting comes from an older movie uh, in which the protagonist tries to convince uh, his, his wife at the time that she's losing her mind. And he does this by sneaking around. Uh, and, and when he's sneaking around in their house, uh, he's going up into their attic uh, to look for something. And when he does that, he turns on the lights in the attic. And now this is an old Victorian home in England. It's an old story that's set a long time ago. And all of the lights in the house were run off natural gas. That's how lights were run uh, in the days before electricity. So when he turns on the light in the attic, uh, it causes a temporary fluctuation in the gas pressure, which means that the lights in the living room uh, go down a little bit. So... That's just what happened in some older homes. You turn on the lights in one room, and it draws some gas away, some natural gas away, which means the lights in the other part of the room uh, dim a little bit. Uh, and she kept saying, somebody's turning the, the, the lights on. I saw the gas lights go down. And he continues to convince her that it didn't happen. He tries to cause her to doubt what she's seen. Uh, and eventually she comes to believe her, or believe him, uh, and comes to think that she's losing her mind. So we call this gaslighting because that's what happened. The, the name of the movie was Gaslight. Uh, but you can suggest things all the time. It doesn't mean that people are being, that, that their memories are wrong. It just means that they're remembering things in the wrong way. And this uh, leads to a thing, to, to another uh, seven sin uh, called bias, which is the tendency for knowledge, beliefs, and feelings to distort recollection of previous experience to affect current and future judgments. So any of the heuristics we've talked about uh, can cause a bias. Uh, so uh, we may remember the wrong information, or we may remember the information uh, in the wrong way, and it causes us to have a bias in our current understanding. So the first three are all about not being able to remember something. The next three, misattribution, suggestibility, and bias, are about how we remember things but not in the right way. And the seventh one uh, is sort of on its own. And this is the tendency to remember facts or events, including traumatic memories that you would like to forget, but you can't because you keep thinking about them. This is persistence. And persistence has to do with this sort of intrusive recollection or rumination. Sometimes we just don't want to remember something, but we keep remembering it. And the more you keep remembering it, the stronger that memory trace gets and the harder it is to not think about it. Uh, we all probably have things like that, things we wish we couldn't, things we wish we could forget, uh, things we don't want to think about, uh, but we do think about them. And so some memories uh, persist even though you don't want them to. So sometimes we don't remember stuff that we should. Sometimes remem we remember stuff that we should, but in the wrong way. And other times we want to forget stuff, but we can't. 
Uh, so our memory just doesn't always work the way we want it to. It is not a system that allows us to uh, have a perfect record of the past. It's an imperfect record of the past, but usually that's beneficial. So one of the earliest uh, and most well-known examples of memory errors is the so-called misinformation effect of Loftus and Palmer. Now, you've certainly talked about this in uh, Psych 1000, uh, and you probably talked about this in uh, 2135 if you took that course. Uh, this is a pretty well-known example. So I just want to go through it quickly. Uh, what Loftus and Palmer were looking for was the reliability of eyewitnesses. Now, they did this research in the 1970s, but most of it still holds up pretty well. So in one of their examples, participants saw a short film of a car accident. Not a bad car accident, but just a car accident. Uh, and after they saw the accident, uh, they were put into a question and answer phase, as if they were being interviewed by, let's say, maybe uh, an investigator. So if you've ever seen an accident, maybe if you've seen a, a hit and run, for example, the police might ask you for information of what you've seen. Uh, and you've got to remember and tell them what you saw. So imagine that that's what this is, how this experiment is being run. You see a film clip of a car accident, and then you're asked some questions as if a law enforcement agent or a police officer is asking questions of you. So some subjects were asked questions like, how fast were the cars going when they hit each other? Other people were asked, how fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other? So this same sentence can be uh, asked in a number of different ways. And in the first experiment she did, in, in one of her most well-known experiments, uh, she asked them with the following five words. How fast were the cars going when they collided, or smashed, or bumped, or hit, or contacted? So these five words, collided, smashed, bumped, hit, and contacted, were the only thing that changed. Uh, in all the questions, you were being asked whether or not, or to estimate how fast the cars were going. So you're going to use your memory to make a judgment. So you're going to use your memory to think about something, but in each case you were asked in a slightly different way. And what they discovered was that when people were asked with more violent sounding words, they tended to estimate the speed as being higher. So people who were asked with smashed collided uh, tended to estimate a higher speed than people who were asked with bumped or hit or contacted. It's as if the word changed the memory. Well, it's not as if, it actually is. Uh, the word seems to have changed your recollection or the subject's recollection of the, ex of the experience they had just seen. They all saw the same video. Uh, they all experienced the same thing. But as soon as they were asked, that word seemed to change their memory a little bit. It distorted their memory. This has large you know, big implications for uh, suggestibility and how you ask people things. And this, re this particular study uh, that Loftus did really affected how people think about the reliability of eyewitnesses. Uh, because our memories are very suggestible. If you're not being asked to pay attention to something, if you just happen to see an accident, you're going to miss details. I mean, after all, uh, Dan Simon showed that people don't even notice if someone in front of them changes. You know, so giving directions to one person, the door goes past, uh, and then there's another person standing there you don't even notice. Uh, so we're blind to these kinds of changes. Uh, so in Loftus' experiment, they were asked to watch the video and remember things. So they were really paying attention. And even under those controlled circumstances, uh, it seems as if their memories started to change right away. So even a few minutes later, if you're asked with smashed versus contacted, you think about the event in a different way which suggests your memory has already changed. One way to find out if the memory really has changed is to ask people about information later on. And that's what she did. A week later, she asked participants uh, if, there were, if they saw any broken glass in the video. So these are the same participants who were asked in the first study with smashed, collided, hit, bumped, and contacted. But uh, a week later, they were asked some more questions. And one of those questions was, did you see any broken glass? And I should point out, in this particular experiment, there was no broken glass in the video. So the correct answer is no. People who were asked with the word smashed were more likely to say yes than people who were asked with the word hit. It's as if being asked how fast were the cars going when, the, when they smashed into each other, being asked with the word smashed 
not only causes you to overestimate the speed or estimate a higher speed, it distorts your memory uh, and creates a, essentially some new information. These people not only have a distorted memory, they have new intrusions on the memory. So this memory is now a different event. People who were asked with hit or with bumped or with no question at all uh, don't, don't report seeing the broken glass. Their memory is more accurate in this case. So this, is, this suggests that the way in which you talk about things or the way in which you recall the information changes the memory each time. Each time you recall that information and think about it, it's, it's susceptible to being manipulated or changed or distorted. Being asked if how fast the cars were going when they smashed causes you to remember a, fa a more violent accident than being asked with hit or bumped. So let's summarize this. Uh, so people who were asked with the words like smashed estimated a higher speed. Uh, I refer to this in the text as a distortion error because they're remembering the same thing, but the memory becomes distorted. Uh, so the words smashed and the questioning, the line of questioning that's used, distorts their memory. Later, those same people falsely recalled broken glass. And I refer to this as an intrusion error because a new piece of information that simply wasn't present in the original event is intruding on their memory, and it becomes part of the memory. There wasn't any broken glass, but once you remember it, it becomes part of the memory. Let's talk about a different kind of false memory. So in the next slide, I'm going to give you a bit of a caveat here. Uh, I would typically use this example in class, and we would present some words on the screen. Uh, and in class, in a lecture, I present the words on the screen and then I would give students a link to a survey site where they could complete uh, a recognition test. And then we would look at their results in real time. Now I thought about how I might want to do that, but that would mean sending all of you a link ahead of time last week uh, to do this survey uh, and then look at your results later before I recorded the lecture. I guess I could have done that, but um, I didn't. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the same example, and then we're going to look at the data that I collected from the class that I taught in the spring of 2020. Uh, in fact, only two or three weeks before we all got sent home. Uh, so this is known as a Dees, Rodiger, and McDermott uh, false memory paradigm. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to present some words to you at roughly one per second, a little bit faster than that. Now, if you're watching this at half speed, or I'm sorry, at one and a half times speed, slow it down for this phase. Okay, so if you're watching this YouTube video at a faster rate, uh, right now I want you to put it at normal speed, just so that we can go through the experience. I promise this won't take more than a few minutes. So here are the words. Try to remember these without writing them down. Just try to remember them as well as you can. Uh, try to commit them to memory, repeat them to yourself, rehearse them, and then we're going to do a recognition test. Okay, so how did that go? Uh, I hope you were able to track through that. I hope my slideshow worked in the right way with timing. Uh, so what normally would happen in, in a class is that I would then present students with a link to a Google Forms page, uh, and we would select yes or no in the study phase, which was the presentation of those words, did you see the word or not? So did you see bark, yes or no? Did you see fear, yes or no? Apple, temper, hatred, fury, anger, sleep, friend. Take a moment yourself just to note whether or not these words, you can assure yourself that you saw them. So do you remember seeing these words? If you remember seeing them, uh, think about marking yes. If you uh, don't remember seeing them, imagine marking no. So we're just doing this as a demonstration. Let's look at the responses, though, that I collected. Uh, and this is uh, sort of critical here because uh, these were students uh, in the spring term, and we just did this right in class. 
Uh, and what you can see is that most people agree on what they saw and what we didn't see. The first word, bark, most of us agree uh, that we did not see it. So red responses are shown, uh, red responses show the no responses. Uh, so bark, we all said no, nobody agreed. Maybe one person thought they saw it, but uh, for the most part, everybody's in agreement. No, we did not see the word bark. But the word fear, uh, that's one that we did see. Apple, no. Temper, yes. Hatred, yes. Fury, yes. Anger, yes. And that's the critical lure. Anger is not a word that was on the list. And if you don't believe me, uh, you can go back and look for it. It is not on the list. But what we noted, uh, and although you can see there's a little bit of disagreement, uh, there's uh, about 18% of our uh not 18%, about 18 out of the 70 uh, students who responded uh, correctly rejected that as a word they did not see. Uh, but about 50 out of the 70 uh, said, yes, I saw that word. Now You might think we saw the word anger, and that's because most of the words were related to the concept of anger. Uh, but go back and look at it again. Uh, go back, um, you know, replay the video, and you will see the word anger is not on the list. Uh, but even when presented in class uh, this past spring, uh, most subjects think that they saw the word. And this, you know, although there's a little bit of suggestion that maybe people uh, correctly rejected it, we're still largely in agreement that we saw it. Uh, and when I ask people ask afterwards, they say, oh, well, I, it seemed like one of the words that was on the list. It just seemed correct. Uh, this is called the Dees, Rodiger, and McDermott False Memory Task, and it's named after two psychologists, uh, Dees earlier in the 1950s, and uh, Rodiger and McDermott, who revitalized the paradigm and used it in new ways in the 1990s. Uh, and in this recognition task, so recognition task is just saying, did you recognize it as seeing, it, did you recognize it as a word that was on the list or not? Uh, the lure word, the critical lure, anger, is often as strong as accurate memory for target items. So people seem to remember it. And this particular paradigm, this DRM task, as it's often called, uh, can reliably produce false memories. So to summarize, our memory is far from perfect. A lot of the processes that aid our memory, like context and knowing the meaning, can lead to errors. So in the second lecture, when we talked about uh, elaborative encoding, I suggested that when you think about the meaning of words, the larger context or the semantic content, it helps you remember those words more strongly, helps you remember those words better. Uh, so uh, in that uh, uh, experiment by Craik and Tulving, where subjects learn to pay attention to either the structural, phonemic, or semantic content, semantic content meant that they were remembering the words better. The explanation seemed to be that activation spreads to related concepts. So when you think about the, the word, you think about words that it's related to in order, order to answer that semantic question, and that elaboration allows you to remember the word later. Exactly the same thing is happening in the Dees, Rodiger, and McDermott paradigm, the spreading activation. So when you see words like wrath, fury, and hatred, they activate the concept anger. You didn't see the word anger, but you experienced it because it was being activated uh, by those other words. So from your perspective, or look, rather from your mind and brain's perspective, the word anger was experienced. It's just that the activation was an internal spreading activation and not an external perceptual activation. It's very difficult to distinguish between the two of those things. So in one case, the spreading activation to related concepts helps you remember in Craig and Tulving, but in Dees, Rodiger, and McDermott, the spreading activation produces an error. And that's what I meant at the beginning of this lecture, which is a lot of times these errors seem like mistakes, but they're really an example of our memory working the right way. Intrusion happen, errors happen when people remember things that just didn't happen, and distortion errors happen when people remember a slightly different version of the truth. So think about how you might use this information when you're studying for a quiz or an exam, whether it's in this class or another class. Uh, use the elaboration uh, to help you remember uh, deeper concepts. So if you need to remember concepts to be able to extend uh, or 
make connections across different topics, that kind of elaborative encoding is going to be really helpful. If you're studying for short answers and essay exams, that kind of information is going to be really useful. That's a good way to study. If you're trying to recognize specific terms, try to focus on those specific terms. Uh, that's a case where you don't want to uh, elaborate too much. If you're looking to distinguish the correct multiple choice answer from some incorrect distractors, uh, you want to make sure you look at them carefully. If you look at them on the surface, uh, those kinds of distractions uh, can happen. So use this information, uh, not just in this lecture, but in all three of these lectures to help you study for other questions, for other exams, other quizzes, uh, and in other classes. Thanks for listening.